Good morning, everyone. Uh, as Mike says, my name is Jason Batiste. I hail from the Matachewan First Nation, just uh, a short uh, 30, 40 clicks from Kirkland Lake. And I'm really happy uh, to be here and, and thank the organizers that think that uh, my story might be worthy, or at least uh, more, more appropriately, the story of the Wabin Tribal Council communities that I work for might be appropriate for your forum. My day job is the executive director of the Wabin Tribal Council. I've been at it uh, for most of my life. I worked at Detour Lake for a few years and then was recruited into uh, sort of the lower uh, uh, lower regimes of the Tribal Council and, and through the years became the executive director. I've been there for 30, I think it's 34 years now or something, something like that, giving away my age. But uh, I started with lots of long black hair and uh, clearly that's not the case anymore. So I'm really happy to be here, and I, I see a bunch of folks that, uh, uh, that I recognize, so uh, it's good to see you again, and it's nice to see and, and likely, hopefully, to meet uh, some new folks in, in the audience. I was asked to give, um, uh, what I should acknowledge, too, the, the traditional lands of, uh, of uh, Fort William First Nations, whose territory uh, they've graciously allowed me to come and speak to you on. Um, I've been asked to talk a, bit, a little bit about how, how we do things, and... Uh, in, in our territory. I work for five First Nations in and around the Timmins area. My, my home community, uh, Chapel Ojibwe, Brunswick House, uh, Metogamy, Flying Post, and, uh, and those communities uh, occupy, or, or rather the mines that sit on there, occupy our traditional lands and have been doing so for so many years, decades, decades, and, and uh, in fact over a century, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. But, uh, so we've had to design a way to engage with those folks. Uh, Mike showed a map uh, earlier about, you know, from, from government about where, where activities, where agreements happen. If you saw the, 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 the most concentrated part where the agreements happen, that's us. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud to say that. We've, we've got uh, hundreds, over 100 agreements with juniors and active minds, and I'll talk a bit about that a uh, uh, little bit more. But it was an interesting map to me and I was looking for us I said that must be because I always say that right we've done it more we've done it the most and we found a way to to engage respect re respectfully and compromise I think in a way that uh, that benefits industry and certainly benefits our communities oh thank you no <laughs> that's backwards oh here we go okay so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, how we came to our model, uh, how, how we, uh, you know, sort of leveraged the duty to consult, uh, some of the consultation fatigue. And I, I've only got 20 minutes or only had 20 minutes, so I'm really going to focus on process and not so much on some of the, the, the nuances of process, but more, more uh, sort of a generalized approach. And those that want to speak uh, more in depth can certainly track us down and we have no issue in, in telling uh, folks and advising, especially industry players, on best practice. I think that's important for our communities to do and we've been sharing our story across the country about, you know, this is a way that you might want to operate uh, as our communities have. Certainly not perfect, but it is a way that we found success in, uh, in, in compromising and, and, you know, given the, uh, uh, I think, the, the, the number of uh, and the amount of activity on lands, we had, we had no choice. We had to find a way because we're just over, we'd be overwhelmed with the thousands of mining claims that are surrounding us. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about maps um, and how they play a role. We'll talk about uh, uh, consultation and accommodation not, uh, not being the same, or at least how, uh, in our view, consultation and co accommodation have to be in, on parallel tracks. One can't get in front of the other because, you know, we know that... Uh, while I love uh, and respect and find a lot of courage, and I, I, I can't agree with Mike Moore that the mineral industry is on the cutting edge of economic reconciliation with our nations, uh, we've been through so much and so many hardships with, uh, with government, with industry, with folks. There's, there's a lack of trust there, and, and it's not okay for something to get out in front of the other because the communities become nervous about, uh, say, a permit goes without an agreement following or at least being agreed to and behind it. So we'll talk a bit about that. So just to give you a sense of where we are, uh, northeastern Ontario is, is my home. I live in Timmins with my family. Um, uh, as you know, uh, I, I mentioned my, my home community, Metatuan, is a short uh, stone's throw from uh, Kirkland Lake, the young Davidson mine. 
is about, I would say, maybe 10 or 15 kilometers as the crow flies from the boundaries of our, of our community, plus all the exploration activity that happens every day. So we've got Mikasa, Newmont, uh, we've got um, uh, Lakeshore Gold, we've got Pan American Silver, we've got almost every major player operating in our neck of the woods. So that's where we live, that's our reality. We live it every day and our, our territory is vast, about the size of France. There's certainly some overlaps there. We'll talk about that a bit and how to deal with that. But that's where we live. So we're right in the heart of especially gold mining, uh, territory precious metals mining. Um, in, in Timmins, the gold was discovered in uh, 1908, two years after the signing of Treaty Number no. 9. In, uh, a short couple of years later, uh, they started in Kirkland Lake. So, as I said, it's been going on for over a century. I'm going to spend some time talking about, as I said, about process. And uh, Mike had talked a little bit about early and often and engagement uh, early and often with, with communities, and I couldn't agree more. There are plenty of, uh, of opportunities for, especially junior companies, to, to uh, engage with First Nations. Um, there's a notification tool that you're probably going to get from government about who to speak to. Uh, George, cover your ears. Uh, the minister, I, I, might, I might disagree, uh, disagree sometimes with, uh, with whom the government uh, tries to tell you to speak to and with regard to communities, but they're a little risk averse in that regard. And sometimes they, they have it a little bit wrong, but, uh, but that's okay. So we tried to design a process from early engagement through mine development that would lend comfort not only to our First Nations that uh, as we move through that continuum, there's some certainty in discussions and agreements and benefits for our communities. But the other side of that is there's some certainty, some discussion and some agreement with the mining industry and with the people that are investing in property, in projects where we live. And the first part of that is a simple letter. So, uh, and especially now that we have MLAS with, with uh, online map staking, it is so, you know, it, it, uh, it's everywhere, it's easy, it's, and folks are doing it all the time. So it's really important for us to have designed a system where we can simply say to the folks that want to uh, engage or, or to stake a claim, just tell, just acknowledge that you're here on the land of a First Nation, whatever First Nations that, that, whose land you're on, just all we're looking for from industry is say, yeah, we know you're here, uh, we know you're on your, we're, we're on your traditional lands, and we will engage you responsibly as we more move forward through the project. In fact, once we mobilize to the next level of development, we will engage you in a deeper agreement through an MOU, so an exploration MOU. So the first letter is just simply a letter to the prospector or the junior saying, I recognize I'm on your land, I recognize this First Nation or that First Nation, we wish to engage you properly, and if we do more outside of the staking, if we invest more, if we mobilize equipment, if we're going to get on the land and create some disturbance, we're going to come back to you and we're going to do an MOU. So that's stage one, letter of engagement. Stage two, uh, an exploration MOU. So what does the exploration MOU do? We, we attempt to engage the uh, companies in, uh, in a way that really does just resource the, the community in terms of its capacity. We know through our experience in, in the Wabin Territory that junior companies, uh, the, the revenue that comes in is raised through the markets. There's no production at this time. There's no revenue from sale of good. And that everything that you do is money out the door into the ground to try and prove up, to try and sell, to try and you know, develop your properties. So in that way, we come back with you know, the, the financial ask for every, well, what does it cost to do an exploration MOU in the Wabin Territory? It's 2% of the exploration cost. It's always 2% of the exploration cost, no matter the size of your project. So in this way, if you're not doing anything, if the pro project lines dormant, costs you zero. If you're out there doing, say, an advanced, uh, advanced plan where you're collaring a shaft to do a, the underground exploration, it's going to cost you 2% of whatever you spend to do that. So it follows a continuum of impact and activity. 
And I, I dare say that you know, your investment cycle where you've got, you, you're able to, to gather some support from the markets to do your work. And I think that's important. The important piece of this is it's the same way all the time. So we have hundreds of these uh, exploration MOUs on the ground active. I'm not going to ask company A to give me, say, 5% of their exploration spend and then tell the person who's got the claim next to them, well, you know, you're, I'm going to give you a deal at 2%. And this happens even if the company say, no problem, I'll give you more. I don't want more. What I want is for our communities to have a consistent way so that, I can, so that they can say to the industry, we are consistent, we're fair, we have our best practice, and it's the same all the time. So what, if you come to our territories, you're going to get a template, a template that's been shared. I can't tell you how many times with, uh, with, with government, with, uh, with exploration companies, and again, it's always the same. And in this way, I, I, the, the, the other uh, the piece of that, I think, is industry can take that to the marketplace. You know, when you're raising your money, when you, you, and, and you, they're, they're asking, well, you, have you got your Indigenous enga engagement squared away? Yep. We have, uh, we've received the MOU from the Wabin communities or some, some other community that's using a similar approach. And to us, that's a saleable item, right? There's value to that. There's value added uh, to your, uh, your project through this, uh, through this uh, exploration MOU. We also, in, in, in this way, we, we would expect that, and, and we, we say this all the time, that the consultation, the MOU is a requirement of consultation. The process of consultation is contained within the MOU. So you don't just get to consult, right, without the balance of the goodies left in the MOU. So there's a business chapter that simply says, if and when you can contract with our First Nation companies, you're going to do that in reasonable ways. It's not very onerous. There's some language to it. It's a little bit more than that. Uh, but in the MOU, it's not very complicated. But my point is that uh, the, the consultation with our community, as I spoke to earlier, has to be in parallel with the needs of the community and with uh, the, the uh, 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 you know some sort of written contract between uh, the industry and our First Nations. <clears throat> so. The next step of, uh, is, of course, advanced exploration, which the MOU will speak to. And I, I did, I did uh, um, uh, mention that you know this continuum of of, uh, of spend and the economic expectation of the community will follow that trend. Right, it follows into into advanced X. The 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 important thing about advanced X is what we build into the MOU is a trigger for impact benefit agreement, or whatever you want to call that resource development agreement, doesn't matter to me, potato, potato. We, we, I still call them impact benefit agreements. I'm sort of stuck there, because I started doing that in 2008. But the, the point is that, um, that in each of the agreements, it pushes you into the next if your project is lucky enough to, to get there. We all know the, the, the likelihood of you know, uh, having an exploration property become a mine or even to get to the advanced exploration stage, how difficult that is. And it's, you know, one in a thousand, one in two thousand or whatever the, that figure is. But in our agreements, you know, each one leads to the next. So there's a built-in commitment from the early engagement letter that says, if I get farther, I'm going to do an MOU. In the MOU, there's a, there's a clause that says, if I get farther, I'm going to do an IBA. So, so each, you know, you, the, the, I talked about early engagement. The early engagement actually speaks to the end game, right? So that everybody knows, or at least the community knows, even if you sell the property, because we also have an inurement clause. So I don't want to deal with you to have you sell the property and then had to do this over again, right? The agreement survives a sale. But the point is that. Uh, that each, each, each stage of the agreement pushes to the next one through a written contract, written agreement in, those, in, in each of those deals. On advanced exploration, in, in the clause for the, for the MOU, you'll find a trigger that says, if you spend X or if you go into advanced X, 
that's the trigger to start negotiating an IBA. Because the IBA has to be done before you start mining. Like, I don't want to be sitting at a table while uh, negotiating an impact benefit ag agreement while somebody's hauling away and, and processing gold ore. I want to be done, right? When you start, I want to start. When you start the engagement on, on an impact be benefit agreement, when the, when the mine starts to produce, we need to be done. So we, we say, you know, whether it's a pre-feasibility study or some other indication of uh, you know, the, the success of a mine or the likelihood of a mine, then we need to start negotiating an impact benefit agreement. Sometimes, they, they, uh, on brownfield sites, which we've done, we've done impact benefit agreements on, I think, uh, four, uh, four mine sites in Timmins. But, and on greenfield uh, operations, we've done about six or seven. I think there's, there, there are 11, uh, 11 existing IBAs in our portfolio. We have three under negotiation. But um, my point is for, uh, for those operations to be successful, they need to come back to the community and get those done. Without the impact benefit agreement being done, our communities know how to push back. We're sophisticated enough, and this is not a threat to the mining industry. I don't, I don't like to do that. But if the, the mining industry, which they always do, if we always reach negotiated compromise, I would suggest to you that there are also ways that our communities can and will you know, enforce, their, uh, enforce the jurisdictions and use the, the levers that they have to make this happen. So that doesn't mean to be a threat, but I, I think the better way is, is, is in forums like this where people are listening and especially the mining industry with its courageous leadership uh, to take on these, the, these particular arrangements. So um, I should also say that the impact benefit agreements, uh, they last through closure. And you probably want to know a little bit about what's inside them. There's, uh, there's rules around, um, of course, uh, 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 economic sharing that usually involves uh, either a, a, a net smelter return or some percentage of revenue. Our communities will not get involved uh, as a strict matter of um, the whole, uh, the entirety of the economic share, the, a bottom line approach or a profit approach. We've been, uh, we've been less than successful, I would say, in that approach. It, 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 it doesn't matter to us. Well, it doesn't matter to us whether a mine is successful, but we're not the operators of those mines. So the risk belongs, in our view, to the company. If you, if you blow it, or if you tell me it's going to be a billion dollars to build a mine and you end up spending $2 billion, then come back to me and say, well, I'm going to be broke for the next 20 years, so there's no profit, and it doesn't spin out any economic benefit to, to the community, that's, that's, that's no bueno. So our communities have gone to what we call a top line approach uh, through a net smelter return or uh, sort of a, a percentage of profit as an economic share to the community. You could also do a combination. We, we will think about combinations of that, right? If there's a, you know, a, a, a top line coupled with a bottom line with some uh, more adventurous communities that will take on some of that risk, that can be done. The other thing that, uh, the other chapter that, uh, that, that, that's important here is the business chapter, where communities will ask you for specific avenues to um, advantage their businesses with respect to servicing the mine. And uh, sometimes, and often, and especially during construction of something like, say, the Cote Gold Mine that uh, two of my communities have an impact benefit agreement with, the economic returns for the community in servicing the mine are far greater than the actual revenue share. I would suggest that uh, you know, the, 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 um, the two communities were beneficiaries of, not beneficiaries, the, the work that they did on behalf of the mine with their partners and on their own resulted in you know, over $100 million of, of uh, benefit uh, to, those, to those nations. You know, if you're going to spend a, a billion dollars, you might as well use where you can the local communities. And uh, the language in the impact benefit agreement, well, you might as well just say it forces that conversation. 
You know, it may cost a little bit more, the price of business, doing something with, I, I would say, you know, challenged, uh, you know, our communities have been challenged for so long, we can't, can't be expected to immediately compete with mature businesses from other communities. So we expect some advantage way to do that. And there are a number of um, processes that, uh, that the impact benefit agreements can have to, to, to roadmap that out. Of course, we speak to environment, uh, you know, ways that communities can help the mine be responsible, uh, be, be more, I would say, uh, uh, you know, respectful of the land in a way that responds to the Indigenous needs, First Nation needs. <coughs> in fact, what we've been doing of late is we've been asking in our impact benefit agreements that mines uh, uh, directly employ uh, what we call environmental monitors. So we train them, we put them, we embed them with the, with the mine's uh, uh, environmental team. While they're working with the mine and are responsible and direct reporting through the, that, that agency the, with the mine, they're also reporting directly to the First Nations. So there's some comfort that uh, what's coming back to the community is a trusted source of advice on environmental matters on a daily basis at the mine. So at Cote Lake, again, we have, uh, we have two of our First Nation folks embedded with uh, the environmental team working on a daily basis. And then there's the, the employment and training side. For my communities, I'm proud to say that uh, if, you're, if, you're not, if you're not working, if you're not looking for a job and you're from the Wabin communities, you're not trying very hard. Again, we have, uh, we have 11 uh, impact benefit agreements. There are job openings all the time. George knows how we're challenged in Timmins with respect to our workforce. So, you know, our communities have um, preferred access to jobs and employment. And a typical, typical language is, that, is, is this in, in that chapter. If our communities or our First Nation members apply and they qualify, if they meet the minimum qualifications of that job, they get first pick. No ifs, ands, or buts. Or with sufficient training or with, you know, reasonable training, they can qualify for that job. They get it, no ifs, ands, or buts. I've had some, some run-ins with uh, you know, uh, uh, employment staff at the mine so who don't really like that language, but it's part of the deal. It's, it's a part of the deal. And I, I dare say, as, as folks look to explore in the, in, the, in the farther north, that that's going to become a bigger deal, that you better get your head around you know, having to invest in training and, and employment uh, for folks that uh, really, really do need it, perhaps more than, than our communities. So I'm getting, uh, I'm getting the wave. Uh, that brings me to the end of, uh, of, of my presentation. But I, I, I'll, I'll finish with this. I, I really do love to share our story. Uh, it works. We've done this a uh, hundred plus times. We've got impact benefit agreements. Our communities own hydroelectric facilities. We were just awarded the uh, 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 Wawa to Porcupine Transmission Line. We are, George and his ministry, Minister Peary, uh, has just, uh, it, we've just initiated um, discussions, <coughs> excuse me, on renewing our resource revenue sharing agreement with the province, which I'm so, so very proud of. Wabin was key, key in, uh, having that agreement done six years ago, and we're talking about renewal now. So we remain what I would consider on the cutting edge and uh, a leader in, in this space. And if you want to know more about what we do, call my office without, without industry knowing, without other First Nations knowing how to get started. Uh, then we're all, you know, I think we're all worse off for that. And if I don't share my story, if I'm not telling people what I know and sharing that with you, then, then I haven't done my job. So thank you very much for listening to me. And again, if you want to approach me directly, I have no problem uh, talking to you. So miigwech.